Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today on day two of Special Operators Week is Robert Hamilton Owens. He was an Air Force pararescue man. They call them PJs. And the PJ's job, well, if a Navy SEAL goes in to wreak havoc, if he gets hurt, the PJs go in, patch him up, and get him out of there. It's a tremendous job that requires remarkable physical capabilities, tactical skills, and the mind of a surgeon in the field of combat. It takes a special kind of human being, and those guys don't get near enough press. They truly are the best and the brightest, and that's what Robert did in Vietnam. He's now a speaker, an adventurer, and an endurance athlete. At the age of 65, he took on five endurance challenges, and on his 66th birthday, he completed the Seal Fit Kokoro 50-Hour Challenge. He has completed 12 Ironman triathlons in all. The most recent was last year. And to celebrate his 67th birthday, he completed seven marathons on seven continents, get this, in seven days. He's as strong and as fit now as he was in his 20s. So he's an amazing dude and a personal hero of mine and Pete's. Pete, of course, is doing the Coronado Swim this Saturday to support the SEAL Veterans Foundation. If you want to support Pete and the SEAL Veterans Foundation, go to SEALVeteransFoundation.org and go see Pete at Coronado Island this Saturday. Of course, we do this along with our ongoing support for Save the Brave. And you can read about them at SaveTheBrave.org. I also want to mention that my body comp challenge, at least this round, concludes this Sunday. I'll be talking about the results on Monday's episode, so look forward to that. And as always, if you want to give support to the Break It Down show, we sure appreciate it. Go give us a five-star rating and write us a little review. Maybe talk about your own fitness goals, if us featuring these top performers helps you out at all. And at the end of today's episode, we really want you to go to roberthamiltonowens.com to read more about Robert, follow him, and see if he might be speaking somewhere close to you or participating in a challenge that you might want to see or sign up for. He's definitely going to challenge you to be your best. Here's our guest for Day 2 of Special Operators Week, Robert Hamilton Owens. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Cope. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Robert Owens, and I'm on the Break It Down Show oh, with man. Pete Turner. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, this is going to be fantastic. So first off, we're at Panera. Thanks to those guys for uh, for allowing us to record here today. You know how I do it. I get on the on the road and, and I get it done, Rob. Yep. Uh, so I want all of you guys actually, to go. Actually, happy Labor Day to you. Happy Labor Day. Yeah, we're also working on a holiday because that's what badass dudes do. Sean Douglas did a great background on you on his podcast and also the Spartan Games podcast. You're on there and they cover a lot of your background. Uh, I'll briefly touch on this, but I want... I want you guys to go check out other places. You know how we do this. Like the background's been told. Let's reference that and, and give Sean and the Spartan Games podcast the reference and the and the hit. So you are a retired Air Force pararescue guy, which means right. you're like a Green Beret, you're like a SEAL, you're like a Marine Recon guy. You're a, a top tier guy. And Marine Recon guys have a bit of a chip on their shoulder because they don't for whatever reason, they don't have the same bona fides. But if you say pararescue Air Force. Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. For whatever reason, they don't have the same bona fides. But if you say pararescue Air Force, we all know. It's like SAS. I, well, see, you know because you're military. Right. But most people, civilians, have no clue what pararescue is. Yeah. Because we're the quiet guys. The SEALs and the Rangers get all the prep. Right. Yes. Yeah, they do. But you're, but you're right. You're like, commonly, we don't know. We, of course, the Air Force has its own special force type element. Right. But 
You guys are no shit. You got not that you need to know this. And it's for the audience. Actually, the fun part is if if somebody wants to know what a pair of rescue guy is, I have them go to that Navy SEAL guy. Yeah. And say, hey, Navy SEAL, what is a pair of rescue guy? And they tell them all about us. Yeah. Because <laughs> they like us. Yeah. Well, you guys are likable. Uh, there's a lot of ego in the SEALs. The recon guys have a chip on the shoulder because sure. no one that you're like you guys are like Rangers or something, right? Sure. The Rangers don't even get included in the conversation, even though they absolutely are in it. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, by the way, then there's a guy like me who doesn't have any kind of tab, any kind of beret, or any of that kind of thing. Right. But I'll go out with all of you guys. That's right. And then you guys are like, Pete's on the team. Pete, you know, so That's right. there's a lot of ways to be special in the uh, in the military and the pararescue thing. I guess for the audience, help them understand. The difference what, with us is that, yeah. that the Marines and the Army and the Navy are all offense. Okay. But we're defense. Okay. So it's our job as, as combat paramedics to go in and get the other guys. Yeah. So we have a different personality, different mm-hmm. kind of guy comes to our thing. Yeah. Like for me, I was a beach lifeguard. Okay. And I got used to rescuing people. I like yeah. being called on, you know, like a fireman, policeman, get in. Right. And we have lots of guys who like the rescue side. What's a problem? Let us fix it. Yeah. And so when I was in, there was only 200 PJs. There was 3,000 Navy SEALs. Yeah. Because we work as individuals usually versus as a team or a squad. And you guys use the augment, right? Like you right. go to a t- So, um, again, Delta Force, aggressive recovery. Like you got snatched up by the Taliban. Here come a bunch of badass dudes with long beards. And they will come get you. But then there's Rob. Is like, I'm going to put the IV in and get save this guy's life. Well, all those guys have that action. And then they say, we're the PJs. We're in trouble. Yeah. And so they say, yeah. whether it's a medical thing or a rescue thing. And it's real fun for us mm-hmm. to get in and say, hi, guys. You know, we're here. Yeah. And, and yeah. Then we go to work. And so you guys are hyper fit. You know, you can drop in at any time, anywhere to help someone out. Are you guys regionally aligned? Like, do you have to know, like, I need to be prepared to go anywhere in the desert part of the world? You know, the neat part about us is that when we do rescue work, we do training in jungle, ocean, desert, mountain. Um, Mall. Yeah, uh, <laughs> trees. Yeah. You know, we jump into 300-foot trees and then have to get some down pilot or somebody's got a broken back and get them out, sticking them with an IV, and then get into a, ho- a helicopter. Yeah. So we're supposed to be able to rescue anybody anywhere in the world mm. at, in any condition. Right. And those schools are real fun because you go and you get to learn about how do you do it at 20 below zero? Or how do you do it in the jungle? Yeah. Or scuba jumps, you know? How do you how do you set IVs and stuff out there in a, in a raft? So a realistic situation is a pilot goes down and then breaks his back on, on egress from the plane and then gets hemmed up in a tree because he can't work his parachute can't, right. So right. he's 35 feet in the air and they're like, hey, Rob, uh, we got a guy with the broken back. Can't move him. You know, you've got to get him out of that tree. How the hell do you do that? You know, tree school was really fun. We used uh, Oregon, and they were 300-foot trees, the yeah. big tall ones. And so when you jump into that, you know you're going to be breaking branches going on through. So you, you put on your special deal so you don't lose your balls, you know? It's yeah, like, yeah. here we go. Yeah. And you have a faceplate that's not going to get crushed by these limbs. So you jump in, break those branches. Then you detach. Then you go find where he is in his tree. Yeah. Then you go up the tree, oh my goodness. and then you set him with IVs and stuff. Then you lure him with Jumars and your beaners and stuff down, get him in a basket, then call in a helicopter to come get him out. So that may take five, six hours yeah. just to get him out of the trees. Yeah, He's all wired up, you know, with his, his shoot stuff. And it, it's, a, it's a technical, interesting kind of experience. Yeah, well, and also an impossible one. I mean, you again, 200-something feet in the air with a guy that can't be moved who's been badly hurt for a while. Because sure. it's not like... Hey, Rob's already en route. You know, your sword, he is flying now. It's like, no, uh, I'm down. Help. Maybe all the work, like, in a tree, help. And then they, maybe they have a uh, personal locator beacon, that, and, you know, and you know. But you're, what, you're hours away at best, if not days maybe sometimes. Could be. Could yeah. be. We did rescue work on McKinley. So mm-hmm. you get the 18,000 feet. Yeah. And you get in, and guys are hypoxic, and they're going out, and you got to get in with oxygen and get them off the hill. Yeah. Um, you do ocean work and jungle work. Uh, you learn desert work. It's just, it's always a mental experience, like a college class, yeah. to learn how to do these things in the dic- different environments. When you, how often do you actually tactically go and rescue someone, whether it's combat driven or not? Like you go to Denali, it's not because of a combat situation, it's because. You know, oh, each unit is different because you're either in a combat theater mm-hmm. or you're not. And if you're not, then the civilians will call you and say, anything that they can't do, would you please do? Right. So you may be doing 
combat stuff or rescue stuff military wise and then come home within two weeks start doing all your civilian stuff yeah so you know you just never know uh, i chose uh most of my stuff up in alaska because it was the busiest busiest uh base or theater that we had and i had to rescue every week so every I mean, week every week wow so i mean i put more guys in body bags than i want to and and it was we covered everything from the north pole to washington and from canada to hawaii Wow. So that's, that was a big, a, that's a big area for yeah. freighters, for yeah. mountain climbing, for scuba, for, for snow, for Mount Rainier, whatever it would be. If you're not doing military at the time, then they, the, the civilians call on you. And then when you're, when you're in that tree, in this case, and uh, it's just too late, does it then become your mission to extract the body but keep you safe? Like, cause there is a level of peril that you're going to go through for someone who's alive. And I'm assuming this guy's gone. Um, he's in the tree. Maybe you just cut straps, and you're like, we'll pick him up at the bottom. or yeah. All that kind of stuff. You you never know. Um, sometimes they're alive when you mm-hmm. get to them. Sometimes yeah. they're not. Yeah. I've had them die on my arms. Yeah. You know, you just play out by ear, and you either have a 130 overhead or a helicopter, and you just say, you know, dead on arrival, or we got time, or we got about an hour to make it with this guy, or he's gone. Mm-hmm. So it's... It's just always one of those scenarios. You never know until you're with the guy what you got. Yeah. Yeah. And then how much allowance do you get? I'm fortunate in that when I go do my work, it's largely up to me. As long as I'm delivering, you know, and getting things that the commander doesn't have, uh, no one's really going to sweat me too much. And and I I don't want to give the impression that I do illegal things, but I also don't want to give the impression that, that I'm not doing things that are in the very dark part of the gray zone. Because it's combat and the rules are different. And the forward deployed guy in my situation, you know, I, it's up to me. I, I can't turn around and ask someone like, hey, um, is this too risky or whatever? It has to be done. So when you're out there and you're making a call, you know, let's say it's a dangerous extraction in terms of there is an enemy environment. It's not permissive. And uh, you have to make hard decisions. Is there, is there trust on your end that like I, yeah, I they, can? They give you latitude. Okay. You make the call. Yeah. Do what you got to do. Yeah, do what you got to do. And then how do you maintain physical fit? How long can you physically do this job, the standard pararescue guy? How, because at some point, your shoulders, your hips, something's going to give out because lowering a guy down, because you are the helicopter in that tree, you know, and you got to get that guy down to the ground so you can get him back up into the air or, or whatever, right? You're, you're the one sacrificing your body to ensure that they – are rescued or retrieved. You know, you you got to kind of stay, and the listener would understand this. You got to you got to stay in shape where you can handle handle angles. Uh huh. It's not lateral movements. Right. It's bending over awkwardly. It's so you, you have to stay in shape um, where you can withstand all the pressure of a hundred to two hundred pounds on an awkward angle. Yeah. So you practice a lot, let's say, with, with sandbags. Mm-hmm. You know, picking them up like dead bodies, and twisting and torquing. Yeah. So I'm a CrossFit guy. Yeah. And um, CrossFit opens up some of it. The other part is just working body weight stuff mm-hmm. where you just practice things that are not linear. Yeah. Angles bending over, backward side, something where you don't pull that muscle when you're... Because that dead weight is a different animal than a barbell. Yeah. You and know. it's dead sloppy weight. So when you go to pick that person up and they're unconscious, they want it. The body wants to not be picked up. It's rolling. It's fighting you. It's well, like trying to pick up you. Yeah. If I had to pick up you, yeah. and you were dead weight, yeah, I'd have a real tough time. Yeah, maybe a lot. Yeah. So we have to stay in great shape, just yeah. like the other the other uh, groups do. It's funny. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but I don't know how well the audience understands this. So in the military community, there's like this uh, evolution that women are going to be in combat. And guess what? They've already been there for a long time. But, you know, one of the things they say all the time is that, well, women get hurt at a greater rate in combat zones, and and then they aren't going to be able to carry a body off the battlefield. Well, first off, first news is everybody gets hurt in a combat zone. If you walk out with zero injuries, that's you haven't been there long enough, you know, because it's going to happen. Right. And then, two, uh, I know it's like from a movie that you pick someone up when you fireman carry your buddy off the battlefield, but the reality is, is that rarely ever happens. You know, and when it does, it's usually some kind of heroic, like, how did that person do that anyhow? So I'll let the female fail on picking me up. But I I bet that if I went down, there'd be more than one person carrying me like they would for anybody. You're in a unique situation where you are two people, but you're training 
to be two people. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen some outstanding women uh-huh. that I would put uh, shoulder to shoulder against a lot of these guys. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, some, there's some really unique ladies out there that have trained. Yeah. I'd be happy to have them on our team. But yeah. Pararescue is still waiting for their first girl graduate. Yeah. Navy SEALs are still waiting for their first lady. Yeah. I think the Rangers have two now, if, yep. I, if I read correctly. And so it's interesting. Um, some of you listening would know of SEAL Fit with Mark Devine. He presently has a gal who's come and submitted herself to him and wow. said, and she's a Princeton grad, soccer uh-huh. scholarship, really smart girl. Yeah. Who said, um, in two years, can you make me a Navy SEAL candidate? And so Mark is having a great time saying, I think I got my first one. Yeah. I just watched her last weekend do 12 hours straight, and um, she was fun to watch. She yeah. smoked all the guys a lot of things. The other thing, too, that we have to understand about these ladies that are taking on these enormous challenges, the tip of the spear is really pointy. It's hard to get on, and most dudes don't make it up. So if you've got a female that gets up there, she's capable, and there's, there's no doubt. And there, she will bring new skills that aren't currently available to SEAL team. I mean, I... As a collector, I know, like, if I go in and there's a female that can collect, I'm going to defer to them because they're so damn good at it because they approach the male world, especially these, these uh, Arab-dominated male worlds. They approach it so differently. I, why would I even bother if they can do it so easily by just sitting there and doing what they do, and then I can work on other aspects that I don't normally get to work That's on? That's right. I just watched a girl. I go back to Lackland Air Force Base to help work with our special ops training. I go back quite often. And uh, we had a great girl in our last class. She was a mechanical engineer. Yeah. Um, three years of CrossFit. Yeah. And she was pretty. Yeah. And she was sweet. Yeah. And um, she was hoping to cut it. And so um, she, she did not, I don't think, make it in pararescue, but they were going to give her other options. Yeah. But it was great to see her go through it. There was one gal with 125 guys. Yeah. In the same dorm, same bathroom, same yeah. everything, you know. Yeah. Her name was Molly. And I said, Molly, how are you doing? You yeah. know? She goes, I'm in the game. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah. And I, she told me her story about mechanical engineer. Yeah. And she just got bored sitting behind a desk that she wanted to challenge. But so I want the, I want, it makes me a little emotional. I want her, anybody who's like, yeah, sure. I, want, I want the bigger challenge. There's nothing wrong with the big military side of things. We were talking about that right. off mic. But if you want that next challenge, you put in that 4187 from the Army side, and you're like, I'd like to go try for the SEALs. Mm-hmm. And the military should say, yeah, go do it. And if it doesn't work out, come on back. That's right. We've got plenty of room for you. That's you know? right. Because that's uh, special happens when people are motivated to do that special thing. That's right. You do something special. Uh, I've not revealed to the audience, but, but you're, you are not a, uh, a young, like, 40-year-old man who's like, I'm looking back wistfully on my days in special operations community. You were 66, is that right? I'm 67 now. 67. And recently, you did seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. I did. And that is just one thing of all of the things that you do. You are still hyper fit. You're a 20-year-old guy fit. You know, I like to hang out with 20-year-olds okay. and 40-year-olds and... Um, I'd like to be around them because they keep me young. Yeah. But if I'm going to train and, and uh, work with these young guys who have these aspirations to be in our special ops military, I need to stay in the game myself. So it behooves me to stay healthy and to stay fit. And then I still like those challenges, especially the ones where they say, you're too old, it's impossible. And I love that red meat thrown out in front of me and say, really? Let's see, you know? Yeah. So it's been fun to, to uh, still stay in the game. Okay. So staying in the game means staying fit. And I know like for my combat time, even if I was like in shape and, and a proper weight, my, my hips are just you know, like golf balls, my, my, the, the socket, the yep. ball. So uh, uh, there's only so much I can do. Like I just, I can't ride a horse because my hips just won't open far enough up. I mean, I could do it, but I wouldn't be happy the next five days. So I understand. How do you how do you deal with with you know just wear and tear injuries then? You know, um, I'm real fortunate. I've always been a guy who stretched a lot. Okay. I remember when Kareem Abdul Jabbar said at 42 at the Lakers, he spent two hours a day stretching. Yeah. And he said the only reason he was playing NBA was because he stretched two hours a day right. at 42. Yeah. And so. Um, between 27 when I got married and we had five kids and 50, I worked out a lot 
and I worked out because it was therapy for me with five kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It, it behooved me to keep my body limber yeah. and stretched and fit. So um, when I turned 50, I went back into Ironmans. Okay. And so I've done 11 Ironmans since I was 50, but I did my first one at 27. And so getting back in the Ironman community just kept my, my body limber because mm-hmm. I had to do things. Yeah. And then I added CrossFit to it. And when I added CrossFit, CrossFit um, makes you do the kind of moves that you would not normally no- want to do. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, I have certain moves that I can function with. Yeah. But they, they have me do things that I would not function with, but they give me overall body conditioning. Yeah. And I think, for those of you listening, if you'll stay in the game with physical fitness... Outside of injuries, yeah, you know, like you have injuries from military. Yeah, I have some injuries, but I've worked around those injuries to okay. do the kind of things that I can do. Right, and I think that, um, generally speaking, if you can just stay physically fit, uh, keep your your muscles lubricated. Yeah, so you don't, you know, if you can keep a strong core, and if you can keep that strong core, keep that lower back in place. Mm-hmm. You know, you just have a lot more percentages of staying healthy yeah. than if you. Let your core go, let your lower back go, and then older guys have problems with their lower back. So that's what I don't want. I don't want a bad lower back, so I work a lot on core. Yeah. And I've always worked on core, not because you're trying to be a core guy, but if you've ever seen anybody with a bad back, <laughs> they'll say, don't ever have one. <laughs> work on your stomach muscles. Yeah. The, the stomach holds the back in place. Right. So I'm 67, and I still do a lot of core, a lot of stretching. Yeah. And then I add my, my strength stuff, and it keeps me in the game. Yeah, keeping in the game. So a lot of us in middle age, they've got, they've got the kids. The kids have activities. You've got a job. You've got to commute to and from the job. And we all know that we're supposed to take care of ourselves physically and mentally and spiritually. And you just start to run out of time. You it's do. Like, I just need to rest. How about can I rest today? You, you know? know, I had to make a decision. I had big aspirations as sort of a type A guy. Mm-hmm. And I knew that if I didn't put myself first, Mm -hmm. and that sounds selfish, but if I didn't get up early in the morning and get my workout in and then get home, take the kids to school, Mm -hmm. I'd never get to anything because my day would be chaos. I'd never have control of my day the rest of the day. I found that my most creative mental time was when I was working out. People say, can I work out with you? I say, no, no, no. That's when my my juices are flowing, when I'm thinking, I'm creating. And then when I come out of that workout early in the morning, my endorphins were there and I'd be mellow and I could think and I could attack my day or hit my day. Um, And it became therapy for me for 20 years that I needed to get my early morning workout in, get up at 5, be home by 7.30, take the kids to school and start my day. If If I didn't do that very many days in a row, I find much more stress in my life. Yeah. So for me, it was a selfish thing. I needed some down alone time to process me, marriage, kids, job, and it worked for me, maybe different for others, but it worked for me to, to put in my time in the morning early and then let the day unfold. And I got in a rhythm. You yeah. Know? <clears throat> Do you work out every day? I have worked out probably five days a week for the last 20, 25 years. Okay. Because uh, Pete Koch is one of the guys that does a lot of shows with me, and you probably know him. He's the Swede from right. Park Break Ridge, and he's hyper fit. And he's like 28 hours of exercise a month. You know, you want to do them at 90 minute intervals, whatever, but you got to do about 28 to really be on top of your game. You don't got to start at 28. You know, you start at 10, you know, and then over the course of a year, work yourself to 28. But it does seem to be a fairly normal thing where. You've got to be north of 20 hours of real exercise to to get your body to where it needs to be. You know, everyone's different. Yeah. But what works for me, it worked for me for a long time, is I do a spin class at 530, mm-hmm. and I get my lungs opened up, yeah. and I'd, I'd break that sweat. Then I'd go right into my core work, mm-hmm. and I'd be from 630 to 7 o'clock or so. I'd do core, 30 minutes of core, box jumps, mm-hmm. or... Different kinds of things. And then I'd do a run for 45 minutes on the treadmill and be done by 8. Yeah. Now that the kids are out of the house. Yeah. And I could be on the road by 8.30 and I got two and a half hours in. Yeah. And it was, there were three different deals and I was working three different things. Right. And then I, I changed that. I went from a spin class to doing my early morning run and then I took a shower. Then I went to CrossFit. Mm. So I had a, a, an aerobic workout yeah. to open up my lungs and then I went to an anaerobic workout which was one hour long. And that anaerobic workout is really the thing I think that has changed my life because spiking your heart, 
driving it over and over again. You don't need to do that very much. Yeah. You can do 15 minutes of that and you're toast. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, yeah. so for my CrossFit, we do 17 minutes of stretching. And I'm breaking a sweat dripping by the time I'm done with my stretch. Yeah. And then we go into a move, and that move is for 10 minutes. And then we do a 15 to 20 minute drive, and you're cooked. And I've already done my aerobic stuff beforehand. Right. So I'm, I'm in a great place in that two hours. Now, most guys say two hours. And I say, if you develop a lifestyle and it becomes a rhythm and a routine, it's like brushing your teeth. I don't think about it. Yeah. It's just something that I do. It's yeah, who yeah. I am. Yeah. I don't have to say, oh, do I want to work out? It's like, oh, I'm going to go work on my, I'm investing in myself. Sure. Let, let me say it. Uh, I speak a lot to groups. And when I speak to groups like over 50, I oftentimes speak on you choose how you age. And you have a choice on how you want to age. And for me, I found that if I would just invest in my health, it made sense, meaning Everybody's working on their 401k and their pension. Everyone's trying to invest in their financial future. Right. Well, what good is it to invest in your financial future if your body's out of whack by the time you get your money? And then you can't use it. You can't spend it because you're going to the doctors or you're going to the hospitals or you're on medications. And so I see all these guys, they're really, really involved on making their money for retirement. But when they get to retirement, they're weak, they're sick. They got, they look like they're pregnant and they can't eat well, sleep well. And it's like, hey, dude, invest an hour a day. Yeah. 24 hours a day, give one hour to health and your future. Yeah. And then work your money the rest of the time. And you'll be able to get in your 60s and 70s and enjoy yourself. In a lot of ways, too, uh, says the fat guy. Um, You're not fat. That, that workout is also investment in your spiritual and mental health, Everything. too. There's it's a lot investment. of value in it, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm investing in my life that I want to get on the floor with my grandkids Yeah, at 70, 75, 80 right. without pulling a back muscle. Yeah. I want to stay in the game. I want to be able to get on a plane and fly 14 hours and feel good. I want to be able to go do my, uh, my adventures wherever it is. And it's not because I'm a stud. It's because I've just invested right. in my body. I, sure. I believe that the spiritual side. I believe that God gives us a body yeah. and he holds you accountable what you do with it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of guys that get to heaven, and he goes, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and you go, you well, we're so soon. Well, yeah, well, my body crapped out. Well, that's because you didn't take care of it. I yeah. gave you something. You didn't change the oil. You didn't rotate the tires. Yeah. It broke down on the side of the road, and it's your problem, dude. And sure. I, you know, I gave you something, and you were not a good steward of that. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you have to own that part of it. And same thing, again, with the spirit and the mental, you, it's a system. It's right? a system. And so you got to put in good food. You have to work on putting some workout and that kind of thing. Um, fill your mind. Like, you know, wisdom isn't given. Wisdom's earned. And all of these things require you to, to meter out some time, meter out some commitment. And then all of a sudden later on, you're like, oh, I'm a lot wiser than I was 10 years Everything ago. Everything that you want is outside your comfortable zone. Ah, I like it. Yeah. There's no victory without a battle. So I should drive further to get donuts. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no victory without a struggle. Yeah, you're and right. everybody wants to live victoriously yeah. and be an overcomer, but they don't want the struggle. So it talks cheap, you know. Let's let's all live these big lives, but who wants to struggle? Let's yeah. go the easy route. And that's not the way life is. If if you're like a, a David Goggins guy, you got you got to put in the time, and then you get to reap the benefits. Yeah, you don't okay. get something for nothing. No, you don't get something for nothing. But for reals, though, a lot of people are really, really busy. And I, I, I'm pushing you on this because the person who we're trying to talk to is partly me, but it's also just a lot of my friends were like, yeah, but I drive two hours every day to go to work. There goes two of my 24. I've got to sleep for eight. Well, there goes 10 hours. So I'm damn near halfway. I've got to um, you know, do all these things. And there's just not enough time. Okay. So let me just say this. I'm 67. Yeah. How old are you? I'm going to be 50 in January. Okay. Let me talk to all you guys out there. You'll make time for what you want to make time for. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You'll make time for what you want to make time for. Okay. You'll make time. You'll change jobs. You'll change locations where you live. 
if if making it to your 50s and 60s and 70s healthy is an issue for you, you'll find a way to win. Yeah. If not, life is full of excuses. Yeah. And losers have excuses. Yeah. And I'm not going to cut anybody any slack. I had five kids. You know, yeah. I, I had Suburbans for 30 years, you know, driving kids to football, 10 years of volleyball travel team, yeah. you know, ski team travel team, gymnastic broken arms, 10 years of Pop Warner. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying when you're climbing that hill, you better put your priorities in order because once you get to the top of that hill and you look backwards, if your body craps out on you, yeah, it was a nice ride, but dude, you didn't handle this right. And so... I find excuses easy, mm-hmm. and I, I had a t- I had a radio program on Angel Baseball Radio. Oh, okay. And it was called Get in Shape and Get Get a Life. Yeah. And the guys would call me, and I'd say, what's your deal? How fat are you? And they'd say, hey, I'm doing this and that. And I'd say, okay. Now, if, if I wanted to help you change, would you change, or are you just going to lie to me and lie to yourself again? Yeah. And I would take guys on that radio program week to week through the scenarios of change. Instead of that bag of chips when you're a truck driver sitting, you know, for a 12-hour run, can you have an apple? Yeah. Can you have a peach? Can you have a banana? Guys would say, but I always have to have my in and out. I'd say, okay, have that in and out and fart and feel like a, just a fat old dude when that thing sits in your stomach. Or you can move over and eat a salad. Yeah. And you can change. So you have options. Yeah. We all have options. Yeah. Uh, food is either for comfort or food is for fuel. Yeah. And most people are emotional eaters. Three times a day, they get to do one thing that they really like. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. But that's an emotional eating. And so when you, when you change, this sounds radical, when you change that food is not your friend. Yeah. Food is for fuel only. And you only eat what you need for the fuel, and, and you don't need the comfort of the food. Yeah. Your life will change. Yeah. But everybody is a comfort eater because it makes them feel good, and they get that donut, and they get the stuff. And I love crap food. But I know that crap food takes a toll on me if I have goals. Yeah. So I just learned early on, you know, one day a week, maybe I'll give myself a cheat day. Yeah. And I'll feel miserable by the end of the day. Yeah. And I'll just go, God, if I can just go back to clean eating on Monday. But it was so much fun to eat the ice cream and the donuts and the pizza on Sunday Mm -hmm. and just power all those bad carbs. Yeah. And feel like crap, sleep terrible, get up in the morning, hope to start fresh. Yeah. And so I'm just like you guys. But. If you want to be in the game yeah. above 60, you better pay your pay your dues early on because yeah. it's hard to recover what you've lost. Well, like you're saying, it's an investment, right? So you do look at like, it's okay to have some emotional eating things. Sure. But, and it's okay to have an in and out burger. I, I have one every now I and then. I love them. Me too. I try to be cognizant of when I have one so that I, when I go to have one, I'm like, oh, it's been a month. I'll have a cheeseburger. You know, I had a cheeseburger last night at a party. I'll try not to have another cheeseburger the rest of September. Yesterday was my grandson's uh, birthday. And so they had hot dogs and hamburgers, right? Uh-huh. Chips, soda, all the stuff there. So they said, hey, hey Dad, what are you going to eat? So I just ate the hot dogs with no yeah. buns. And I ate a burger with no patty, with no uh, stuff yeah. on it. And I just ate that. And one patty and four hot dogs. I was a full guy. Yeah. And then I chose to have one soda and the rest was water. And I walked away. And I had a salad for dinner. No harm, no foul. I was a nice guy at the birthday party. They didn't think I was weird, some some health fanatic, you know. Yeah. I, I imbibed with them. But I didn't eat all the crap that came with it that I really wanted. Yeah. But I knew it wasn't going to feel good four hours later. You were telling me before. So Mark Devine and I, we've talked about having him come on the show. We just have never gotten to it. So I need to get to that. Um, and I may lean on you a little bit for that. But they, Do they know who Mark Devine is? Uh Mark, I, I, yeah, well, I guess let's explain that in a second. But also, he has, you talked about earlier, he has a uh, SEAL preparation school that you can do. He has a podcast that's really good. Yeah, and then he has right. Like, then he has SEAL Fit. And SEAL Fit was a CrossFit that was designed because the Navy said to him, we have so many guys not making it through buds. Would you take a, a, a CrossFit, turn it into a SEAL Fit, and we will send guys who want to become Navy SEALs to you prior to going in? And... Mark then, Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine retired. He started Steel Fit, and he had a 95 success rate that if you could make it through his program, you'd make it through Buzz. Say what? 95. Wow. Okay, so one of the things that happens in SEALs, and, and they push you. They push you to your give-up point, and, and you're not even 80% of the way there. Like They push you way past that. Um, Duke Harbin said it best. He's a former SEAL, been on the show. He's like, I was prepared to die. And that he's like, so the, the school couldn't beat me because 
beating me meant that I was dead. So a lot of guys have stress fractures. They full on break bones. They they work their way through pneumonia until they they pass out. We had a, a Remy you know. Adeleke is his show's going to come out uh, in two weeks. Um, he developed you know swimmer's pneumonia and was still pushing, pushing, pushing until he blacked out face first into the sand. Didn't even know anything for several hours until he came back. So it's one thing to say you're fit and you can put a boat above your head and do log PT and go over the dunes. But it's another thing to have that mindset of, I'll be goddamned if I'm going to be damned by this. You bet. So mental resiliency, mental toughness is a completely different animal than physical fitness. Right. There's a book out that the listeners may like. It's by Mar- or by Matt Fitzgerald. It's called How Bad Do You Want It? Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a PhD thesis on the chemicals that are released in your brain from mental pain mm. versus the different chemicals released in your body from physical pain. So there's two different types of pain that most lay people don't know about. They okay. just think pain's pain. So mental toughness has its own chemical release yeah. of pain different than physical pain. Huh. And the mind, you know, will always quit before the body. Yeah. And so his book is a thesis of Olympians, Tour de France guys, Ironmen who have hit the wall and quit mental pain. Yeah. Who then retrain through that mental pain, learn to make that mental pain their best friend. Yeah. And then they don't collapse when they go back through. When you're doing pararescue, ranger, seal stuff, they want to take you into mental pain. And the, the key is, they say, we have a 20X principle. And the 20X principle is, you have 20 times more potential in you yeah. than you've ever allowed an instructor or someone to bring out in you. Okay. Now, we'll take you 20 times further than you ever thought you can go, but it's going to be through pain. Yeah. Now, do you want the pain? Mm-hmm. And are you willing to go through that pain? And for pararescue, they say, we've got to take you through that pain because we want to know when you're going to quit on your man. Yeah. And if you hit that pain threshold in the field and it's too hard to continue and you quit on the guy you're supposed to rescue, those guys have put their life in your hands. Yeah. Then when they hear pararescues coming, there's a hope there yeah. versus the pararescue guy is going to quit on you yeah. because you're, it's too tough to rescue you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the whole thing of the special ops community is to help you learn mentally and physically that you can do the things you don't think you can do. But it's going to be a challenge yeah. to do that. So yeah. whether it's a broken leg, you can do it. Whether it's a broken arm, whether you have a bad one. Marcus Luttrell says, you know, he's crawling in Lone Survivor. He says he has 12 miles to crawl. He's been shot three times. And he goes, this is a piece of cake <laughs> compared to Hell Week. You know, you know, he's a happy yeah. guy to be crawling on his hands and knees, yeah, yeah, yeah. moving that thing out in front of him. And that's what we try to train a pararescuer, or Mark Devine will say is, let me develop that threshold for you where right. when you get in the game, you're not rocked anymore. Yeah. You, you understand that pain, right. and it doesn't have to be a deal breaker. And I like that because I see so many kids who think they want to do something great, and then they hit that pain threshold and they quit. And they say, I knew I should never have done this. Or I shouldn't have tried this, or my yeah. friends were right. And the answer is no, you should have tried it, and you're capable, but you just hit the wall and you didn't know what to do with it, so you quit. Yeah. Okay. But you have this potential in you that if you'd learned to work through that before you came in the military and understood that, you could you could do things far better than what you did when you tried out in the military. Yeah, there's another thing, too, to that. Uh, in the SEALs, in scuba school, they put you in a situation where you're supposed to drown. You know, because they want to know that you're going to be if you're underwater sure. doing some underwater work. You need to know that each of us knows that even up to the very end where we might drown, uh, we're focused on the actual mission. We're not focused on fear. We're not going to react in a negative way. It's the whole fight, flight, or freeze. In this case, parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah, exactly. Fight or flight. Right, yeah. And so w- when you get into that moment, you know, freeze is a prop- an appropriate response sometimes. Sometimes it's just, but you don't want, you want to be in control of that response as soon as you can. Yeah, your limbic brain is going to fire and give you an impulse flight. And you're like, nope, I need to freeze. I need to stay right here in this moment and continue to focus on right. this. And it's, um, you learn that a lot of times through the failure you're, that, and when I say failure for the audience, I mean in, in this one specific task, you're in the pool, you have to keep your hands above your head with 100 pounds of gear on and tread water. And the moment your hands go below the water, you fail the test. You have to fail these tests so that you can get to the point of going, this is not failure. This is, you know, I've got to get past fear. I've got to push harder. I've got to push longer and see where that 20% is because it ain't fun up there. 
And they're not going to let you drown. Yeah, 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 right. I, <laughs> and they're going to revive you yeah. or they're going to pull you out. But right, yeah. Some of these guys do technically die. They drown. They drown. With, without help, but there is help right there, yeah. Yeah. And when they, when they come up, having drowned, <laughs> and their buddies grab, or the instructor grabs and pulls them up, you know, and pops them, and they go... Wow, that's intense. Yeah. But I didn't quit. Yeah, <laughs> right. And that's what they're all trying to get through is that whole thing where I'm prepared to give my life to make sure that you're okay. That's right. And and the pararescuer is going to go in. He's not going to say, hey, this is too dangerous. Like, and this is not meant to be a, an attack on the dust off, guys. But the, the folks that fly in with the helicopters and, and extract you with an injury... Their job as a big military unit is to come in like, hey, the landing zone is clear. No one's shooting at the helicopter. We're going to extract all your injured now, and you're going to get world-class life-saving capability. But they are not flying in 30 seconds earlier when there's still hot guns out there. That's just not what they do. So when Rob shows up, he is in that zone. Like, you do go in where it has to be, where, however dangerous it is, to pull that person out. And I'm sort of creating a, a, a rigged scenario, scenario mm-hmm. but... Mm-hmm. But you're not going to quit. You're in the ocean. You're not sure you're going to make it. But I would say all of us in our special ops communities, that's how we're wired. We're wired. Wherever else is getting out, we're going in. And so they go in on offense or I go in. Pararescue Google is in on defense. But we're going in. Yeah. We want to be in that moment. And usually, if it's probably safe, we're probably not there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, that's not, it's not ready for us yet. Yeah. So one of the things, too, and I guess and I'm illustrating this for the audience just so they can understand, like, what the difference is between the corporate person, the big military person, and the special operator. When, when uh, someone asks me, like, but is it scary when you go onto the combat field? No. No, no. I mean, yes, of course, somewhere in the back of my mind, there's fear, but I have a job to do, and the job is paramount. And so when I put my foot, that first step on that patrol, I understand there's someone who's probably looking at me through the scope of a gun, or they have their finger on the number nine on their phone to push a bomb button or whatever. But that's really not even tertiary. It's, it's quintiary or whatever. Like, yeah, it's, I'm aware of it. I'm staying aware, but my job is out there. Mm-hmm. My job is to be in that mm-hmm. tensive, tension-filled space to go see the person who is probably a murderer, you know, many times over. And would gladly murder me in the right situation. And I've got to go figure out how to make friends with that person. None of that is comfortable. It's all shitty. And then I have to do my prep. I have to do my, my report writing and everything else. And eat and work out and all these things. And oftentimes, well, you know this, Rob. They'll be like, it's a 36-hour day today. You know? Yeah, it'll be Wednesday in a few hours. And we just finished up Monday. But, you know, that's what we have to do. It's... um. It was really interesting for me in my 60s okay. to wonder if I could do my 20s. Oh, okay. Interesting. So when I did Seal Fit with Mark, it's a 50-hour nonstop challenge. Whoa. And I remembered, you know, pararescue training, uh, we had some long days. Yeah. But I wondered, in my 60s, could I still do 50 straight hours of nonstop CrossFit kind of work? This is in Mark Devine's school. Yeah. Okay. So he has a 12-hour challenge. Uh-huh. Nonstop, a 24 hour challenge, and then he has the big one, which is 50. Right. And the reason he runs 50 is they find that if a guy can make 50 in, in Hell Week, uh-huh. if he can make it from Sunday at 5 to Tuesday night, yeah. he'll usually make it to Friday. Yeah. But most guys quit within the first 50. If they make the 50, right. they can make 55, 60. And so you're 70. talking about Hell Week right now. Right, Hell okay. Week. Okay. So I wanted to see if a, if a 66 year old guy. Could, yeah. do, could do 66 mentally okay. or do 50 mentally. Yeah. And I didn't know if I had the ability, like what you're saying, a 35-hour 35, 35 day or 40-hour day. Yeah, or, right, or, yeah. It's been a long time since I stayed up for two straight days. Right. Plus doing that stuff. Yeah. And I thought it would be a great challenge to, to see what my body would do at 50 straight hours. What and kind of uh, calories are you taking in during these 50 none. hours? You what? Take, you have an MRE. Yeah. You have, you have two MREs and you get one bar okay. and a bunch of water. Yeah, so you got about 3,000 calories to play with. Ish. So if you're in the field, yeah. you're not going to have you know, good food. Yeah. You're going to have an MRE yeah. and maybe a bar if yeah. you're fortunate, and that's it. Right. But an MRE weighs, what, four pounds? Something like that? Three pounds? Oh, a lot less than that. You think so? Okay. Yeah, I'd say a pound. Okay. And it's crappy. I hate them. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you don't want to eat them if you don't have to. <laughs> but I'm trying to get. So, when when someone goes into the field and you don't know when there's food coming, you bring food with you. And an MRE pouch is probably, I don't know, it's maybe like 
three inches thick and about 10 inches long and about four inches wide ish. And so you you can only carry so many of these things, plus your ammo, plus your radio, plus, 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 plus. So um, carrying two is a lot. I, I wouldn't carry a whole MRE if I was going on a foot, foot patrol. I wouldn't. I would maybe carry a piece of and it. And it seemed like every MRE that I ever ate was made 10 years prior. <laughs> It was surplus. Just, it was just crap. Mark's going down to the Army Navy surplus and buying oh, his gosh. MREs used. Okay, so fifty hours straight, and then what are you doing during these fifty hours? And log in PT, course? log PT, in and out of the ocean, uh-huh. up and down mountains. So the same thing they're doing in Hell Week. Yeah, you stay wet the whole fifty hours. They keep right. you muddy and wet. Yeah, spray down with a hose during the ocean for the fifty straight hours. Right. So you, it's a different experience, but but fifty hours is a trip because you hallucinate. Uh huh. You, know, yes. you know, you see things, you talk to yourself, you have voices in your head that you didn't know were there. Yeah. You know, things come out of the dark. You know, it's just, it's a weird, fun, interesting kind of a thing. But, How, but they yeah. do that because in Navy SEAL training for Hell Week, if the kids can make it to Wednesday, yeah. they can usually make it to right. Friday. But most and there's kids training break. subsequent to Hell Week, but you've been through the Hell Week. You, you, hell the rest week. of it is manageable. Right. Wow. In this 50-hour block of time, you're 60, 66 years old when you're doing this. What are your peers around you and your cohort saying? Come on, Mr. Owens. Yeah. You can do this. Yeah. I um, was the slowest of all the guys in the runs. But my core work and my PT work, yeah. I could keep up with all the kids. Yeah. So push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, mile runs and stuff, I could do that. Um, but when I had to do maybe... 500 soft sand lunges with pack on down the beach. Um, my thighs were screaming at me. The young guys, um, they did much better than me. So I had my area of expertise, and everybody there did better in one area than another area. I was great in PT. Yeah. I had a tough time with the, the endurance stuff, like long, long runs right. or long, long Says lunges. Says the marathoner. Says right. the marathoner. So is that age, or, or what, what do you attribute that to? I mean, at some point, your body does not perform at the same level as someone who's 20 and for some aspects of it, right? Yeah, I'm sure age for sure. I was real fortunate because they said to me later, they said, you're a PJ, and you're the first PJ to ever try to do this Navy thing that we've ever had. And so we're going to allow you to continue as long as you don't quit. So we're going to drive you as hard as we do the 18, 20, 25-year-old. But if you don't say uncle... We're going to let you stay. But they didn't tell me that initially. They told me that after about 40 hours. Okay. <laughs> they didn't tell me the first 40 hours. Yeah. So it was interesting to just hang around with the young people and have them say, you good, Mr. Owens? And I'd yeah. say, yeah, I'm, I'm good. You know? Yeah. And lie to them. Yeah. You're, you're bad after the first hour. <laughs> no, <laughs> you were actually good. You were miserable from hour two on. It's not called feel good week. It's called hell week. <laughs> yeah. And so it was it, age is a big deal. I would not want to do it again. If mm-hmm. I had known what I was getting myself into, I probably wouldn't have done it. So you'll be doing it again, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So Come on, let's be honest. You're going to do it again, right? No. Never. No? Oh, no. It would be stupid. My back went out on me at about the 42nd hour. Okay. Coming out of the second night, we'd been in the ocean all night doing beach PT in the dark. When they got us back into Temecula... The first thing they did, it was about 50 degrees out, and they sprayed us down with a hose. And we had to do a bunch of pool work. We yeah. have to swim in your fatigues back and forth. And then they put us out, and the sprinklers had been in this, this grass. And the grass was probably two inches tall, so it was all muddy and cold. And so they said, we're going to give you some breakfast. And we, I knew it was a trick because I'd ask them. They wanted to get you to puke your breakfast. So they gave you more than an MRE, yeah. and they said, eat as much as you want. Because I had heard that then they're going to have PT that caused you to puke because you went emotional. You didn't yeah. eat correctly. You ate what your emotion said. Then they yeah. say, you don't want to do that. We're going to show you why you don't want to be emotional. Yeah. We're going to make you puke. So when I'm sitting down in the grass, just muddy and wet, my back gave out. It seized up on me. And so they, the medic came over and said, how are you doing, Mr. Owens? I said, I can't move. And he said, okay, let's uh, move you out of here. So they picked me up and put me over on a concrete step of a bathroom and I laid shivering under a metal blanket before the sun came up. Yeah. Finally, the, finally the sun came up and they said, hey, Mr. Owens, we're going to drop you if you don't get it back out with your team. I yeah. said, how much time do I have? 
And they said, you have about five minutes to get it together. Otherwise, you're done. And we want to medical you out. We think you've done really good. You've gone 42 hours. Yeah. It's a win. We are going to drop you, most likely. Yeah. I said, no, you aren't. And uh-huh. they, said, they said, yeah, you are. I said, no, I'm going to die first. Uh-huh. I'd rather there die is. first. <laughs> I'm dying on this hill. Stand me up. Yeah. And so Can you press pause for a second? So I want to hear what happens, but you have a wife, you have kids, and you're, you're, you're this fool old man who's 66 years old, like, I'll die before I quit this shit, that, that you don't have to do. What does your wife say about this nonsense? Oh, she didn't get it at all. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he died exercising. I don't know why. Well, no. she's okay. seen me pass out in Ironmans, you know, yeah. in the heat. And so... You know, she's seen me do the, the wiggle and peeing in my pants, you uh-huh. know, in the Caribbean or someplace, you know. Yeah. So she, at first she was freaked out, and then she just got used to that. That's just what you do. Okay. Uh, press play on, you've got to get up and get going. They're going to medical you, and you say, God damn, if you will, I'm going to go. So when I run back out to my team, the, the instructor is always looking for weakness. He mm-hmm. wants to exploit a weakness to see if he can get you to quit, if you're why is still strong enough to hold you. So he said to me, Owens, how's that back? I said, good, sir, ready to go, sir. And he said, all right, give me 16 running somersaults in a row in the mud. Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, sir, love to, sir. Yeah. And he smiles like, I'm going to break you now. If your back was bad, now I'm going to break you. Uh, Running somersault. So you're running and doing a tumbling run. You run and dive, and then run and dive, run and dive, run. You're 16 nonstop in the mud. Yeah. Water splashing, sun's just coming up. Yeah. It's really cold. And I do my 16. I say, this is going to be unique. I'm going to have to figure out the angle to not tweak my back anymore right. as I'm hit my head and roll yeah. and spin and get dizzy and all that stuff. Yeah. So when I get to the end, I stand at attention and he goes, Get over here. And I run back to him and he goes, How do you feel? I said, I loved it, sir. Thank you very much. And I was just happy. To get through, you know, I figured yeah. it out. He said, good, give me 16 more. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so he drove me again yeah. and then stood up and he goes, and I go, bring it. And he goes, okay. And the point was, is that you don't know what you can do yeah. until you take the challenge and they want to find out if they can find that weakness in you because the Taliban are, is looking for a weakness. Sure. Al Qaeda is looking for a weakness. Yeah. ISIS, they're looking. If you show anything, that's when they're going to pile on. And so they would pile on every single one of us if we exposed any weakness in anything we were doing. Right. They'd make us do more of it. So you suffer in silence. You smile. You love it. You're dying inside. Yeah. But you just say, "I love it, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I paid money for this." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they just paid money. And I'm not, you know, every other word is an f bomb. But I'm not yeah. going to say that here. But yeah. Anyway, it's it's a fun thing when they take you through that and you get through it, and they say, um. All right, good. Let's go. Talk about these voices, Rob, because it seems to me that those voices that you don't know are there, they're always there. They just have to yell as loud because you're not pushing them. You're not exercising them. Exorcising is what I'm saying. Is, is, uh, is that a correct assumption? You know, pressure, uh, you don't know who someone is until you see them under pressure. Fair enough, yeah. You know, the, the gal you marry in the honeymoon is not the gal you get in that big fight. When there's financial pressure, relational pressure, job pressure, you don't know who that person's going to morph into yeah. until that pressure hits. Okay. When you're in that pressure, all of us think thoughts that are bizarre. I want to kill somebody. I want to do this. I want to do that. I hate them. There's no respect. Why is this happening to me? Blah, blah, blah. You have all these thoughts. I mean, when I was doing the seven marathons, we did four night marathons in a row. Mm-hmm. And it's in the dark. You know, normally you run a marathon in the day and you look at things. But when you're running at night in the dark and there's no one around you yeah. and you're out there all by yourself, you have these voices in your head talking to you like, what are you doing out here? <laughs> I mean, why are you here? Yeah. Or, you know, whether it's in Perth, Australia, or it's in Dubai, or it's in Lisbon in the rain and you're falling in the rain because you're running on cobblestones and it's two in the morning and it's cold and it's, you're wet, you're soaked. And these voices are in your head going, um, you are really, really stupid. You know, I mean, that's for sure. Or why don't you just quit? Or why don't you don't need this? And so everybody has voices. And the key is to learn how to handle 
the pressure voices okay. that come and argue because there's one on the left and he's arguing with the one on the right and your head's in between them and these two voices are going on then some cousin comes in from the back and starts talking to you too and you have multiple voices talking multiple things under that pressure and you have to sort of pull out of it and watch them argue and not stay a part of it because you've lifted yourself up out and you've kept your center you've kept yourself in that place which voice is the one that helps you the most we teach at seal fit mm -hmm. we teach at spare rescue that there's four steps to mental resiliency number one is how you breathe it has to be nose breathing can't be mouth breathing okay it has to be deep breathing there's a different kind of oxygen that gets in your body from a nose breath, mm -hmm. parasympathetic nervous system, than your mouth breathing. So number one, you get control of your emotions by the way you breathe. Mm. Number two, you have positive self-talk. So I had a mantra that I would say out loud to myself, talking mm -hmm. to myself, mm -hmm. that was positive, okay. that would fight and combat the negative voices in my head. Mm. So I would speak out loud my positive affirmation words, which would cancel out the thoughts in my head because I couldn't do both thoughts at the same time. Right. One's going to win, the silent one in your head or the one that's coming out of your mouth. So when you speak your positive affirmations, this is a good day, I've, I look good, feel good, I'm Hollywood, this is epic, this moment's not too big for me, I can do anything, um, pain for a moment, legendary for a lifetime. Yeah. You just keep saying things to yourself and pretty soon those negative voices leave. So first is you get to control your emotions with your breathing. Yeah. Second is positive self-talk. Thirdly is micro goals. You break everything down into the next 10 steps, the next minute. Yeah. I can't do the next hour, but right. I can do the next minute. Right. I can do the next 30 seconds. So I break everything up into mini goals. And then number four, visualization. Okay. And visualization, I had to think there. And visualization is in my brain, I have focused seeing myself winning. And so when I, when I keep those those the visualization the micro goals the breathing the self-talk going it cancels out all the voices that are in my head and it's a non-stop war right one hour five hours and you just keep talking to yourself out loud and you learn to breathe so i ran all seven of my marathons with my mouth closed on purpose yeah i trained so that i would have better air and I'd be in control of my emotions mm -hmm. versus let my emotions speak to me while I'm feeling crappy. So you're circumventing the bad voices before you even start because you're doing the nose breathing and you're controlling your emotions. And then if you need to talk out loud, do those things. Did you have to get to the uh, out loud affirmations? Oh, or? you bet. I did all the time. And I carried three by five cards in my pocket where they're mm -hmm. all written out. So if I had to, I would just pull them out and I'd read them out loud to myself. Yeah. And they were all sweaty and crumpled. Yeah. And they were, they're going to be historic monument pieces, you know, <laughs> these pieces yeah. of paper that were going to go through yeah. everything that I was going through. And, it, and, it, I, and I learned all that from my, Mark Devine in the training on how to become mental resilient or yeah. mental toughness training. You have a book coming out in about two weeks, probably about a week or two after the yeah. before this show uh, comes out so it's called, it's called beyond called average beyond average and the point is is that i was never any good at anything i was an average swimmer average runner average water polo player yeah i never got a first no scholarships i was an average kid but my coaches told me that hard work could out outlast and outbeat better talent and so from high school on they would say owens uh you're probably not going to win but this is what you can do. Yeah. And if you'll do this, you'll be surprised at what you'll end up doing. So when I learned that average is okay, as long as you go past average, because you've learned how to go past average, then it, you don't have to be a super stud to do great things. You don't have to be Mr. All-American. You don't yeah. have to be the scholarship golden guy. So in pararescue training, like in SEAL training, so oftentimes the guys that make it are not the studs. They're the guys that mentally are in the game. They're scrappy. Yeah. And the good guys who have relied on their good strength or number one, they give because they're not used to the tension yeah. of the fight. Right. Where the scrappy guys, the five, six, seven, eights, they've always been an underdog. And they've learned how to stay into it. So, yeah. so many of, like on my team, well, we had 150 guys come out those Saturdays to be a pararescue man. We graduated about seven. Wow. All the good guys quit. All the average guys we st we hung together. It's it's true. Like especially like in the special forces, because of the way they select psychologically. When you meet a guy who's a green beret, and gosh, I, I don't I don't want to say this incorrectly, so I'll say it as best I can. They're often physically unimpressive. You would never know. 
You know, it's like this little guy, you know. But if you were to get on a mat and roll with that guy, he would never quit. That's right. And, and he would just outwill you. So when you're thinking about. He would rather die first. Yeah. <laughs> and you think about like the bell curve. Everybody's like half of us are below average. And so if you can will your way to the front end of that curve, you don't got to be at the flat part and the very tippity front. But you just got to say on will alone, I'm going to get to 60 percent, which puts you on the front end above average. And you really can do that if you're out there and you're investing, like you were saying, like a portfolio, constantly investing in your strength, which invests in your mentality, which invests in your spirituality. Right. When I speak to young people today, and I speak to lots of young groups, I remind them that average is okay. Don't, don't compare and contrast yourself against some superstar, some, some brilliant person, some yeah. super athletic person. Don't do that. You just have to up your game a little bit all the time and work on your stuff. And average will get you beyond average if you research, train, study, learn about it. But just don't compare yourself with the super hot shots. You'll be discouraged. Well, because everybody has. The other thing is these are all multivariate things. So you, if you focus on oh, that guy looks great with his shirt off, you know, great. But he also might be weak minded. That's or right. Or whatever. You don't, you don't know. And, and you don't want their Most problems are. in him. Yeah, right. There's, there's a, there was a genetic benefit for a lot of times for that look where not that these guys don't work hard, not that incredibly bodied people aren't out in the gym, but, but we all have a challenge. We all hit our capacity on something and you have to push through. And so don't worry about them. Don't, don't worry. worry about you. Just stay in the game and focus on getting okay. better every day. Every all day, right. what am I doing to get better mentally? emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, socially. What am I doing today to be the best version of me that I can be? And I'm not going to worry about all the others that are much better than me. I'm just going to stay in this game. And that takes a lot of work because most people don't have the resiliency to just keep working on their stuff. Losers hang out with losers. Winners hang out with winners. Um, Excuse-minded people always find excuse-minded people. Yeah. Mediocre loves mediocre. And if you can learn to... to Look beyond that and say, what's it going to take for me to get better at whatever it is today? Over five years, you change. You'll grow. Yeah. And they'll have peeled off and fallen back or something will happen to them. They'll get a flat tire somewhere and you're still in the game. Do you have your cards with you? Your little three by five cards? Are they on I you right now? No. Oh, shoot. I was hoping to see them. But I think about that as being like, like you said, these, these monuments to these challenging times when you pull them out and you go through, you know. Each one of those are obstacles that you could have gone the other way. And I'm assuming instead of giving up, you went forward and used those cards to go forward. If we all had a collection of cards like that, you'd have a collection of moments of growth. I couldn't have done it without positive self-talk. Yeah. The negativity was too strong. I had to learn how to get my brain to shut up in Kokoro, 50-hour yeah. challenge, cross Greece, seven marathons. You have to learn how to... How to take your mind on yeah. and cancel it out and overcome it. And that takes practice before you get there. What's the next big thing you're going to take on? I'm not sure. Uh, not I, that writing a book is not a big thing. No, actually, I wrote two books. Oh. I wrote a book about the five things that I did that they said were impossible. But then I, I wrote a book on how to do the first book. Yeah, okay. Meaning how to do anything. And that book came because there's just so many kids that quit. And it, it so upsets me when I see these great kids, yeah. smart and bright, and then somewhere mentally they break down and they just quit and pull the plug on themselves. And when you say to them later, are you glad you quit? They're all kicking themselves saying, no, I wish, but I hit the wall. And I said, well, we all hit the wall. Yeah. But you hadn't practiced hitting the wall. And either they take failure personally, I'm a failure, or they take failure as a stepping stone and they learn from that failure and go back and try again. But most so will quit. Because they take it, I failed, so I must be a failure. And that's not true. One of the biggest things that I've learned in my life, Pete's going to talk now. Pete's talking. You have to find out where the work is. And that's oftentimes where that wall is. And if you get good at hitting that wall, you will figure out, like, not that way, not that way. Okay, we're going to go, you know, because you have to be in that moment. You know, doing, doing work in combat zones means... Not where the goal is, the outcome. The outcome's impossible. But what's possible today, right now? Here's where the work is right now. Correct. Yeah. Funny. Great. I did Iron Man number three in Honolulu. So there's only two of us left in the world that did Honolulu Iron Man and then Kona. Iron Man started in Honolulu. Yeah. And that's where it came from. It was the three toughest races in Honolulu. Do it one day. Bring a beer. 
bring your A game, there you show up. In that, I passed out in the marathon, about the 14-mile mark on the Honolulu Marathon course uh-huh. up by Diamond Head. I'm laying in some guy's yard. I'm doing the wiggle and peeing in my pants and just my body's out of control. I keep saying to my body, will you stop this? And yeah. my body is yelling back to me, no, no, it's not in control anymore. When these guys came and gave me Gatorade and blah, 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 and I'm laying there for a long time, they finally stand me up. I get up, and I can't walk, and they teach me how to walk again, and I do this thing. It's pretty soon, it's sunset, and it's cooling down, and I run, and I get to the end of the Ironman, and they go, the race is over. I go, no, I'm just getting going. I'd passed 15 guys up. Away. I passed out like 39th and woke up in 54th and then got back down to 39th. And I said, no, you can't be over. I'm just back in the game. And I learned then that just because you hit that wall yeah. doesn't mean you have to stay on the ground and it's over. When I went and did Kona in 2003 for the World Championships, it was a really hot day. And the ambulance was taking guys away all day long. And so, you know, when, you, when you're on the marathon course and you see the ambulance just every two minutes taking another guy who's that passed out. That is not positive talk. It's, no, it's, and it's hot. <laughs> So I get to about the 21st mile, and I pass out again. I, fall, oh. I, I stop to take a pee, and I, I, and I turn sideways. I just fell over the side of the highway. So I'm laying there. I wake up, and the stars are above me, and there's a nice breeze, and that asphalt feels wonderful on my back. Yeah. It's dark, you know. And this ambulance guy is there, and they're, are you okay? Who are you? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I say, this is sweet. And, <laughs> they, go, and they go, sweet. I go, I've been here before. This is, this is fine. Give me a few minutes. Yeah. And they put some fluids in me, you know. They stand me up, and I say, I'm ready to get back in the game. Yes. And they go, don't you want to go to the hospital? And I go, no, no. This is not a deal breaker. I've been here before. Yeah. That wall is not a wall. Yeah. It's just a moment. Yeah. And if you, as in life, don't get used to hitting those walls, I mean, like, I lost my house in the, in the, in the recession. Yeah. You know, I built a $2.5 million house. It went on the market for $700,000. Oh, my God. People said, what are you going to do? And I said, shoot myself. And yeah. they laughed. And I said, I guess I have to start over again. And they go, how are you going to do that? And I go, I don't know. I don't know. But you find a way that that wall is not have to be a defining moment that, yeah. that collapses your world. So most people don't want that kind of experience of hitting those walls. But you don't know how strong you could be or how, can you, how resilient you could be. You'll just lay down like everybody else unless you have, have learned and yeah. trained and practiced that life can be tough. My dad said to me, he said, uh, when I lost my house, he goes, uh, you boomers have had it pretty good for a long time. He was 97, and he was a Depression-era kid where his right. family sold apples on the street back during the Depression, you know. His grandfather was an apple seller, amongst other things, to try to provide for eight kids. And my dad said to me, you know, son, you've been living pretty high on the hog for a long time, you and your generation. It's about time you feel reality like the rest of us. Yeah. And I go, oh, thanks, dad. Appreciate the encouragement. <laughs> he, said, he said, get over it. Yeah. Start over. And I went, I was sort of expecting some empathy or some kindness right. or like, I'm really sorry, son, this had to happen to you. And all you do is tell me to get over it. You know, get over it. I just lost $2.5 million, paid for a house, and... And you just saying, what's up? Get yeah. over it. And I said, thank you. Yeah. I'm sure I'll appreciate this later, you know? So sometimes life is not easy. And if you're looking for an easy life, you're going to have a lot of problems because when you're dealt the bad stuff, you yeah. collapse. Anyway, that's my pontificating. No, that's, that. you're supposed to. I mean, it's powerful stuff, and I, and I appreciate you doing it. Yeah, well, we're, we're wrapping it up right now, but everybody should go check out RobertHamiltonOwens.com. Your book is called... Beyond Average. It'll be out. You can get it on there. You can get it on Amazon. And you guys know the deal. If you get the book, a uh, five-star review, and then write it up. And he needs, I don't know, four out in about two weeks. Two we're, weeks. We've, well, just, we've just put the pictures in. But by the time um, the yeah. book comes out, this this show will come out two weeks or Good. so after. But yeah, so this is how you help him out. And, and honestly, like we bring these guys on because we all can go out and find the work. We can push our limits. We can get to those walls. And then that stuff, it pays off. You get to the wall 10 times, you're way better at getting to the wall than time one. You know, um, 500 and fucking whatever podcast by the time this one comes out. Better believe I'm better at making podcasts now than I was at podcast two. You know, you just keep going, you keep improving. And uh, I'm telling myself this as much as anyone because one of the next things I'm going to do is go get in the pool 
and I'm going to go throw down some laps and continue to recover from the hernia surgery while getting ready to go swim around Coronado Island, at least in a relay. Maybe next year I'll do the whole damn thing. But this is what we do, right? We go out and uh, we find out where the adversity is. Lick each thumb and get ready and get after it. You remember, know? remember this. I, I'm not a guy that likes to suffer. Yeah, apparently. I'm, not a, I'm yeah. not a suffering guy. You know, it's not like, oh, where can I go suffer today? I just know that life has difficult moments. Sure. And if you're not used to pressing through moments that are difficult, you'll always run and you'll be running a long time from a lot of stuff. So as Goggins would say or others, suffering sometimes will find you out. Yeah. Mental, emotional, relational, financial. If, sure in life, you're going to go through stuff. And if you don't learn it to, to sort of say, I need to learn from this, it's going to eat your lunch. And we want to learn how to not have our lunch eaten. We want to learn how to stay in the game.